Yay, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> made it. We made it. Okay, everyone, uh, I, th I think we're Facebook and YouTube today. Thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about some really interesting science today, a little bit of science -er science for those of you who like that. Um, and it's pretty cool stuff. And it's, ah, oh, we're talking about things that we talk a lot about, like leaky gut <laughs> and digestion and absorption and all those kinds of things. So I'm happy today to have my guest, Betsy Redman. Uh, she is a PhD and MMSC, which means she has a master's of medical science. Very cool. She's the co-founder and chief science offer for officer for innovative pet labs. She's worked in clinical laboratory education research for almost 20 years. Her master's of medical science is from Emory University and her PhD in nutrition is from the University of Georgia. And she's an active member of the American Academy of Veterinary Nutrition. Her research has included evaluating the impact of diet on colon health. We talk about that a lot. How to target education to make changes that improve laboratory values. Oh, that'd be good. Uh, and in translational science, finding the best ways to move new research into applied clinical care. I told you it was science or science. <laughs> <laughs> in her professional work, she was a member of the team that brought the first available gut microbiome PCR test to market and has researched how to apply metabolomics, the study of metabolites, in clinical practice and the differences across species. As a co-founder of Innovative Pet Lab, Betsy's goal is to provide easy-to-use testing that gives pet owners a deeper understanding of their pet's overall health and actionable steps. Those are good to have. <laughs> Dr. Redmond lives in Atlanta and enjoys... Oh, we're there occasionally. Are you? Um, well, I'm yeah. here. <laughs> uh, and enjoys spending time with her husband, three kids, and two dogs, Ollie and Linda. What kind of dogs are Ollie and Linda? Um, Ollie is a mostly pit, but pit Pomeranian mix which is apparently popular in South Georgia. Yeah, okay. we had the same thing. So um, yeah, he so he's a rescue from South Georgia and you could hear him bark if somebody comes to the door. <laughs> and Linda, um, she just passed away. She was Aww. 18. So Ooh. yeah, she was running around the day before she died. So um, she was a feist hound and cocker spaniel mix. So Aww. she was obsessed with the ball. But our joke was we were we were getting ready to look for colleges for because she was eighteen. <laughs> well, there you go. I hadn't thought about that, but I got I, well. I got I got one that's. Hitting. You got to get them off to college. Yeah, yeah. I got to get them off to college. I got to got to get them a little healthier first. Okay, so we we want to talk about innovative pet lab um, today and some of their testing. These are for dogs only, so kitty cat people. Uh, I think. No, we have two of our tests we do for dogs. Dogs. So inflammation okay. and leaky gut. I mean for cats. So inflammation. Oh, okay. And leaky so we have them for we kitty cats. For too. cats and dogs. Yeah. All righty. So I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> I've given bad information. What can I say? Okay. So we have four test kits that we're going to talk about. One is called digestion and detox, and it measures um uh enzymes measures two enzymes to identify how well your pet is digest digesting their food and their level of detox activity because we all know that better digestion equals better absorption of nutrients and then we have inflammation and immunity which is used to identify and calm increased inflammation and oh my gosh talk about inflammation being a problem <laughs> Yes, across the board. Uh, gut disorders are common in dogs and are often, well, in cats, and are often related to intestinal inflammation. And this test can identify gut inflammation and level of immune response at the gut lining. Then we have a leaky gut test. How many people want to sign up for leaky gut testing? Because, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and so this will identify the health of your pet's intestinal lining and reactions to gluten which is important. Um, and then we have the comprehensive review, uh, which examines three distinct gut functions, digestion and detox, leaky gut, inflammation, and immunity. So is that so all three of, it that's all of them put together? together? Yeah. Each test is, uh, is a pair of markers. And then so and all, that one does the whole nine yards if you yep. need the whole thing. Um, and so if you go to their website, which is innovativepetlab.com, and you use the code Dr. Judy, you'll get 25% off your test kit, which it's kind of a big deal. If you're doing the big guy, it's like $350. So 25% off is going to be a good deal. Um, all right. So just throwing that in there at the beginning. And now we're going to talk about what these do. Uh, so Let's talk about the inflammation and immunity tests first, which Rhett, 
uh, measures calprotectin and SIGA. So what do we need to know about that? First of all, what are those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so calprotectin, it's, you know, it's a pretty common marker. I mean, you do it in people, you do it in dogs and cats. It's a marker of neutrophil infiltration into the gut lining. So it lets you know, is there inflammation there and the level of inflammation? So neutrophils are white blood cells and mm -hmm. they are the ones that are produced when there's a lot of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, you, you can find like, you know, they'll have vet schools and you can find papers where they're looking at if, if inflammation is there and then the level of inflammation, they decide like at a, at a low level, they'll change pet food at a higher level, they'll give antibiotics and at a much higher level, they'll give, you know, steroids. So those are what you see in the research. And we're like, you know, that's not what we see. <laughs> we see people dealing with, you know, changing diet, anti-inflammatories, you know, so. Um, doing, it, thing, doing things without wrecking the gut further. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing, you know, because I had worked in human labs for years and then it was, you know, it was actually Linda who had gotten sick. And I was like, well, wait, I talked to clinicians about doing these tests and I'm going to do it on Linda. So, um, you know, and we started working with her gut. I mean, she was easy. She was so grateful. <laughs> but um, so, you know, I wanted to see her inflammation go down. Like, is that her main problem is inflammation? Plus, I didn't want to go after the wrong thing. So looking, is exactly. there inflammation? And then the other marker we look at is secretory IgA. That's the S. So secretory IgA and IgA. Ig stands for immunoglobulin, so it's a secretory immunoglobulin A. There are several different types. There's E and G and M and D. So the secretory IgA is the immunoglobulin that's at mucosal surfaces, surface. So it's the first line of defense if something happens, if there's parasites, pathogens, food reaction, it jumps up there. So high levels can indicate you know, you're reacting to something. And really low levels, like with puppies, you can kind of see it kind of gut maturity. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, let's say somebody did this test and they get high levels on both saying that, look, we've got inflammation in there and like everything's reacting. Uh, then when, when you get that result and you see that, do you give them actionable steps that they should follow or is it here, yes, you do have inflammation going on in there. Take this to your <laughs> bye, <vet. laughs> bye. Yeah, um, yeah. We have actionable steps. So we have an interpretive guide. You can go on online and kind of it'll go over what we're looking at, and then it'll say if it's high, you can do this. They are a little more general, you know, like you know, changing to different dog foods. Try changing proteins, anti-inflammatories. So um, we have a lot of partners that we work with. And so we have, you know, companies we think are good, but we don't want to just say, always use this. You may have something that's going to work also, but looking for anti-inflammatories and usually, you know, a lot of times the first step is, is changing the food that they're getting. You know, we get a lot of people who st are starting out on kibble and then you've got, you know. Even if it's really expensive kibble, you got to kind of say, hey. <laughs> hey, it's, it may be expensive, but it's not working for your pet. So, um, right. you know, and, and maybe it does work for your pet, but this is one of the ways you can find out. So if somebody's looking for, like, what reasons would people, like, jump onto this test? Would this be because their pet is having chronic diarrhea, chronic vomiting, blood or mucus, like, are those yeah, all those things. things. Okay. Yeah, all those things. Skin conditions, all that kind okay. of stuff. Um, and because everything that. is related to the gut. <laughs> Everything's related to the gut, so it's hard to. Yeah, you want to. You know, it's a good place to start. You know, looking yeah. to see like is every is everything you're doing really working for your dog or your cat's gut? Like, you know, making sure because calprotectin specifically, it's used in people to help differentiate, and it alone doesn't do it, but it helps differentiate um, IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, to IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease. 
And so one is, you know, Crohn's and colitis, things like that would be IBD. So a really high calprotectant can identify a problem. And oftentimes, just like in people and pets, you may not know that they're having this. There may not be significant symptoms. Eventually, there will be. Yes. But so you can kind of catch it early, you know, because most gut issues in, you know, in mammals in general, don't just show up like I just got this condition. It's takes decades, you know, for people and years for pets right. you know, of not doing maybe what's good for them. Right. Okay. Uh, let's move on to one of our favorites, the leaky gut test. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man, we talk about leaky gut a lot. So let's, um, I think we have a, a good graphic we can show. Um, so this is a strong intestinal lining is associated with better health for sure. Uh, what do people have to send in? Are they sending in stool samples for these? Yeah, they send in a stool sample. So, okay. you know, like you showed, it's just a box you get. Okay. And then you just open the box up. I got to know how to do it. Um, you just open the box up and it has instructions has this card, which you have to register it so we know it's your test. Um, and then it gets this tube and you just fill it up. It's got a little spork on it. Sporks. <laughs> and we have a glove and a bag. And then we also even have oops, tongue depressors because some people prefer this. Um, yeah. And so you just put it in there. Um, you put it in a little bag. I just dropped it. Um, and then you put, <laughs> put that back in the box, put it in a mailer and you just put it in your U S mail. If you can't cool. send it right away, um, then just put it in the freezer, let it freeze. And when you're ready to send it, you can just send it. Very cool. So okay. it's, it's easy to do. Like we were going to use like FedEx or something, but we couldn't, when we were developing the test, I didn't have time to drive over to FedEx. So we're like, let's do it in the mailbox. Yeah. Let's make right this easy. There. I love it. All right. So let's talk <laughs> leaky gut. You want to give us a quick rundown yeah, on so leaky gut? Yeah. The, the two pictures we're looking at are just like, you know, um, I guess uh, the left side is the, the, the pretty light pink one. I don't know if left and right are the same one. I think it's um, right. So <laughs> it just, you know, gut, like your the cells in your gut just line up really nicely and they open and close a little bit. There's not a lot of, there is some permeability. You can't have an impermeable gut lining, but if there's inflammation or other damage, they start to open. So one of the proteins that we look at is zonulin and it's a epithelial. So it's a gut lining protein. Um, and it, it increases the permeability of your gut. So there's, you can see there's those little things that are holding the um, gut cells together and those get knocked off with um, the zonulin. So the more zonulin that is there, the higher your level of um, intestinal permeability. Oh, cool. And yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a good way to see, you know, and it's always kind of going up and down a little bit. So even if, you know, um, zonulin was discovered by Alfonso Fasano um, and he noted, you know, that it increased with intestinal permeability and a lot with gluten. So even if somebody doesn't have necessarily, you know, celiac disease or some kind of thing, um, or you can still have a reaction to gluten and you can cause that zonulin to go up. Um, and for a lot of people, it might just go up and come back down. But if it's really high and you have a lot of it, you may have a leaky gut. And the problem with that is you see that like red inflamed kind of gut, things can start to come through in between those cells that you weren't really, your body's like, what's this doing in here? And then right. it starts an immune reaction or like, oh, it's this protein from this food. And I didn't normally hate it, but now I don't know what it's doing here. So big, you know, so it causes, it's an associated with more food reactions too. So in the test, we look at zonulin and then we look at, um, like anti-gliadin, so which is a marker of gluten response. And what's really interesting now in the pet food industry, they used to put on the label things like corn gluten. Uh, and at one of the mo more recent AFCO meetings, they changed that, that now the label can read corn protein. So you don't even know oh. if you're feeding glutens because they may not be on the label anymore. It may have been changed to protein. 
see. So, which is sneaky. Yeah, it makes it sneaky. harder. Yeah. Sneaky, sneaky, Feels sneaky. dishonest. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, we're going to measure those two things on the leaky gut. And then uh, the other one is the digestion and detox. And that is going to measure elastase and beta glucuronidase. So, you'll have to tell us what those are. Okay. Yeah. And this is the one that we don't do in cats. Like okay. we are testing cats. And so there's just so much less research, I'm sure you're aware, in cats. Yeah. So when you're setting reference ranges or doing testing in dogs, you can look at other studies and what other labs are doing. But with cats, there's just not as much information. And we just these just markers didn't look right to us. So we just didn't want to put them out, you know, for cats yet. So they may come out in cats at some point. We're constantly collecting data and looking to see what other research is. But so it is looking at two markers. One of them is pancreatic elastase. So that's a proteolytic enzyme and it gets secreted by your pancreas. Um, you know, by your pancreas, your dog's pancreas, <laughs> your cat. So it's just, if you have a pancreas, it can get secreted to help digest protein. But it's more stable than uh, some of the other enzymes. So okay. um, it's a marker of overall pancreatic function. So it can identify if there's any impairment in pancreatic function. In people, so is it only going to identify if there's a low function or would it identify if you had like a pancreatitis and there was a bunch no, of No, it's just produced? low function. Yeah. Low. It wouldn't okay. be yeah. And it's if it's real low, you probably still want to get like the TLI test, like, you know, the, the trypsin test because it's not considered like diagnostic. I mean, if this were really low and your cat your dog was losing weight, certainly you need to go, you know, see your vet. So it can give you an idea. In the research world for pets, it's like you have, you know, a, a pancreatic insufficiency or you don't. Um, in people, because there's so much more research there, they find that, and I think they're going to, the, the, they're going to find this in eventually in dogs also, that maybe you don't just not have pan good pancreatic function. Maybe you just have impaired pancreatic function. Mm. Maybe it's like not, you, it's a diagnostic or not. Maybe it's a spectrum. But right. they don't really have that. So okay. when we look at it, like, it's pretty low. It's like 10 that we're looking at. Um, and that's, you know, consistent with dog research. But you'll see dogs who are in the thousands, oh. you know, so it goes really high. Okay. So then you're kind of, you know, and that's what you want. So you want a pancreas that's, that's and dogs making... who are eating more good quality protein, like in people, likely have higher levels. Okay. Um, so it's kind of given us just kind of a, an idea. The other marker we're looking at is beta-glucuronidase. So beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme, you know, dogs will make um, and they use it. They don't need a lot, but gut bacteria also make beta-glucuronidase. So if it's really high, it's likely high because there's an impairment of, of gut bacteria. So I might then move on to look and see what the gut microbiome is. The problem with elevated gut beta-glucuronidase is that it likes to pull glucuronide molecules. This is, I'm, I'm sorry, I always go too technical. <laughs> it, it likes to pull glucuronide molecules off of things that have gone through glucuronidation, which is a detox process. Okay. So, and it makes them free so they get to recirculate. So it's going to, you know, I think of it as like um, you have things like hormones or toxins and you're, you know, they'll go through glucuronidation, like putting handcuffs on them and then they're going to send them out. But okay. then beta glucuronidase is there and it's like, oh, I need that little piece in the middle of your handcuffs. So it takes it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the toxins and the hormones are like, oh, well, we can go where we want. So they might uh -huh. get excreted depending on where it happened, or they might just get reabsorbed. Okay. So sometimes it can concentrate, you know, protein, um, toxins or hormones. So we're also looking at that. Kind oh, of cool. Stuff. All right. So that all makes sense. Uh, like now, so let's say somebody has what they think is a normal pet. Um, mm -hmm. do you get like normal stool samples from people who are like, yeah, I just want to see what's going on. And you find out, wow. Like, because you were saying it takes years sometimes for right. the symptomatology to show up. So, so let's say I have a four-year-old dog and I'm like, well, things seem to be going pretty well, but 
not really 100% sure. If I sent in a test on what I think is my normal dog, is there a chance that it's going to come back and say, well, you know, you got some things starting to go on there? Yeah, I mean, it would be a good opportunity to see, hey, you know, it just like in people, you can use it to kind of assess where, where am I at really? It's not so far down the road. And that... so we talk about doing, um, you know, like blood tests on our pets mm -hmm. annually. Is this something like if, if I were to do it on one of my, let's say I had a dog four years old and I'm like, well, I'm just going to see where we are. And it comes back and everything looks pretty good. If I decided to send it in every year, would I be able to use that for like following trends and go, mm -hmm. well, that looked pretty good last year, but oh shoot, that it went up. Like, yeah, I, is it I, something I, that you could do something like that? Yeah, it's like a health check. So okay. you can just like, yes, everything I'm doing and everything they're exposed to, like maybe you don't change something, but maybe the neighbors spraying their lawn with something you don't know about, <laughs> you know. <Dang> neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> um, my daughter is my neighbor, so if she sprays oh, something, okay. she's in trouble. Yeah, well, at least you can walk <laughs> into her house. <laughs> <laughs> Give her a what for. Um, but yeah, so I think it's it's just a good, because things can, like a domino effect. So if things go wrong in the gut, and then, you know, they can start to happen. So you get inflammation in the gut, you can have, you know, then get a leaky gut, and you can start to become reactive to foods you weren't reactive to. But a lot of it's a slow process. So just right. checking, you know, it was good last year, just making sure, you know, just part of a health check. Love it. Um, do you have any case studies you can talk about? Yeah, we, I think we have one we gave. We have Rudy. He's a Ooh, little... Any chance? Yeah, you don't, you don't need to see me for Rudy because I can't. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to say, just, just block yeah. us out and put Rudy up. So it just shows that he has some markers. So Rudy lives in town. He lives, you know. He, there we go. Yeah. So he lives in Atlanta. He was on regular kibble food. And he was just a dog, you know, we had started with, well, when we were setting reference ranges, we're looking for, you know, lots of healthy dogs. So, and healthy means like they don't, they don't have any diagnosed conditions. They seem fine. <laughs> so right. as a, just like in people, it's hard to know healthy. So we put him out. He had some issues. So he had some skin issues and occasionally he was throwing up, but you know, so we, you know, we, we kind of pulled him out, but he had a response to gluten. And so the, you know, the owners were surprised. He had increased secretory IgA and an increased zonulin. So, you know, those kind of, it hadn't gone to inflammation or any kind of, it hadn't gone there because Rudy's only, I think he was, was he four years old or two years? I think he's two years old. Um, so then, you know, um, the owners changed the pet food completely and they got some, you know, some supplements that were kind of gut soothing and, um, uh, they had Saccharomyces boulardii, some slippery elm things, you know, different products. And then they tested again later. I think it was, was it three months later? We usually say three months. Um, and oh, things improved. So, I mean, and that's not, you know, you would, I would expect that. I would have been surprised, like, if I hadn't seen an improvement. Sometimes when you get things that are just like four times the reference range or there's tons of inflammation, those can be a little harder to work on. But a dog who was having like a reaction to gluten was eating gluten every day. He also lived in the city. And so when he went on walks, he just ate whatever he found on the ground, which was a, a problem. And maybe exposed to a lot of sprays and chemicals and things, mm -hmm. like Lord knows. Um, so that was interesting. Joey, I don't know if you can put up the first one of those um, again. Uh, yeah, that one. Uh, so his zonulin, even though this dog didn't have uh, like this raging IBD, he came back with a high zonulin, like double that your high end. Mm -hmm. um, and so he had leaky gut, but wasn't, you know, it, like if they hadn't done, done this test or hadn't done any changes or kept doing what they were doing, I would suspect that with what we're seeing here, this dog... Um, 
within a reasonable period of time would have a lot of allergies and skin issues and potentially full-blown IBD if they hadn't addressed that. And this is a young dog. So that's a, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, certainly like zonulin is associated with food reactions. So because like big proteins are coming in and nobody can yeah. stop it, you know, then the normal processes aren't there. Oh, I love it. Um, so we have a couple questions that were in, um, okay. uh, it says, do they need to be fasted before you get the sample? Nope. 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 So just yep, poo. Nope. Just whenever. And yeah. if they're taking digestive enzymes and probiotics, do they have to stop those beforehand? Um, this is a, in lab, in lab science, this is always a big, like, can, can you get to baseline? There's nothing they're going to be taking, um, like supplement wise, that's going to interfere with the test itself. Okay. Um, like with running the test, what okay. they're doing can influence what the results might be. So if, if they were eating a really healthy dog food and they weren't having a gluten reaction, they wouldn't have it, you know, that right. kind of thing. So you don't have to stop. Like the elastase they're looking at is the elastase. It's not going to be in the digestive enzyme. That likely. You're so, okay. So that's yeah. good to know. Um, and then somebody said, so if they live in Canada, could they have the test kit sent to them in Canada and mail it in? We are working on that. So <laughs> yeah, we're, we're hopefully soon, hopefully soon. Okay. So All right. unless yeah, you have a friend in the States, you can, how close you are to the border. <laughs> it's, uh, so is that because, I mean. Uh, it's just different shipping rules. Um, and you have to, part of it is like the learning curve of their shipping rules and okay. getting it through. And it has to go through a lab there. So you have to get relationships. Is that just so. because it's a biologic sample? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, in the U.S. mail, you just have to have at least three layers and then you don't have to. I was going to say, I think it. if I would in Canada, I'd put it in a big padded envelope and <laughs> readdress it. Yeah, we can. <laughs> don't tell them what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's just me. I like to bend the rules. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's like in people like the, st you know, state of New York doesn't do a lot of tests that all the other states do. So a lot of people will get PO boxes in Connecticut. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. They have a special wow. board that decides. So I, I would never even think of those kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, most labs that sell in New York will have like a price list for everybody else and then different one for New York, but so. Makes sense. It's always yeah. it's expensive to live there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of lab rules, but we want to get into Canada. Um, so. Yeah. We're getting a lot of yes, please. Um, so, uh, so feeding raw and homemade would be a good idea, making sure it's all on the right track. So if, you know, I, I would hope that on my, what I think are healthy dogs, if I send this in and I'm, I may just do a bunch of these just to see. Um, uh, so if I thought I was on the right track and everything was good, it would still be worth sending it in because you might find out like that little dog. Oh, maybe we're not on the right track. <laughs> right. And especially when they're younger, I mean, just like, you know, when people are younger, the things don't show yeah. up when you're 20, but well, suddenly you're 50 and it's like, Oh, I can't yeah, do that I anymore. I should have run that test on myself a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> this is very cool science. I don't know why yeah. I don't know why I haven't sent anything in on my dogs. Get on um, it. Okay, so the kitty cats can get two out of the three done. Right. They can do the inflammation tests, so the calprotectin and the secretory IgA, okay. and then they can do the leaky gut, the zonulin and the, the um, anti-gliadin. Okay. Very cool. This is awesome stuff. Um yeah, and I will say, like, when people are trying to decide if it's too much to do the comprehensive and you have to pick one, I usually think of the inflammation and immunity as the one to start with, if you okay. got to pick one. Just because, okay. to me, like, once you've gone, once you have, like, some inflammation, then it's like, er, you really have to get on it. Okay. Good to know. Um, somebody says, who recommends treatment? So you guys have a list on your website of, like, we need to soothe the gut. So maybe slippery elm, marshmallow, whatever. Right, right. So we have some partners we work with that, right. you know, sell products. And we tell you the type of things that probably you need. Right. And then, you know, there are other, like if somebody does it and they come see you, then they can, you know, <laughs> you would they know what to do. They can't come see me 
They can, oh. they can email me, but um. yeah, email you. They can email you. Yeah, and we have other you know vets listed on there that we have worked oh, with awesome. before. So okay, that's good to know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we're getting more of more of that. Like, no, Tracy, I am not testing Gigi. She's perfectly young and healthy. That I, it's one of my eleven barn or nine barn cats. No, she. <laughs> <laughs> She's only a year old. She's one of our kittens. And I mean, those cats are freakishly healthy. They live outside. They catch critters. They eat raw food in addition to the critters they catch. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the life of Riley. Like all cats should be able to live. Like my, I, I people, oh my God, you keep your cats outside. I'm like, they were born in a barn. Well, they were kind of born in my house, kind of born in the barn. Um, and I'm not having all 11 cats in my house. And, and they, they love it. Well, oh they don't want to be God. in your house. They live in a, they, they, two of them, Gigi and Q come to the back door and they're like, we, you have air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> All the rest of them are like, yeah, we're hanging in the barn. We're in front of fans. We're, you know, they've got heated little beds in the winter and fresh food twice a day, wh whatever they catch too. They get uh, fresh eggs from the chickens. I mean, these are, these are like that happiest. Oh yeah. Cats. They don't. Yeah. And they get to romp and play and. Uh, it's amazing how, like, we don't, everybody, this, we are so off topic, but I'm going to go here anyway. Do it. We, we get so, um, kind of lazy, especially with cats. Cause we're like, yeah, they sleep all day. They're just going to do their thing. If you could see, first of all, these cats are lean. They, they get fed a lot, but they are lean because they are active all the time. If you could see how much time cats in their element spend hunting and pouncing and grabbing prey, we it's summer. We have grasshoppers yeah. everywhere. These cats, like you look around. One of the cats, I was sitting in my office working and looking out the glass wall. I'm like, what is he doing? He's stalking <laughs> something in my backyard. And I'm like, what is that cat doing? And he was like, kind of like, me, e, e. like maybe I want to touch this and maybe I don't. And so finally, I was like, I had to go out there and see what he's. Oh, he was playing with a six foot black snake. I'm like, oh, <laughs> he he did back off. I was like, but, you know, I was very thankful that he told me it was out there because if my mother had walked out in the, in the yard with that black snake, oh, that would right. have been my yeah. mother. <laughs> so, but he, he he was like game on and then he went, mm, might be too big. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that, they, yeah, I know my mom used to, grew up in Canada on a farm and they used to just have cats running all over. I mean, I guess you'd call them feral cats, but they were ours are incredibly tame because when they were born, I was like, you know what? We have too many predators outside. So they did stay in the house for the first 10 weeks mm -hmm. with their mamas. They destroyed parts of our house, but mm, brand Wait, new that's house. a sacrifice I can it, see. It, you it's make. what they, <laughs> yeah, it's what they do. Like, uh, they, they were locked in one large room, but they of course wanted to come out and play everywhere else. So they put their little feet under the door with their long nails that I couldn't trim because they were going to go outside. And they did this on the bottom of the door. <laughs> like the bottom two inches of the door is gone. Let me out. <laughs> we want to come play with you. No, you don't. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your time. This, this was, uh, Boy, I learned a bunch today, and this is really educational. Well, yeah. uh, we talk about leaky gut all the time, but we don't talk about, and we talk about the microbiome and you know, testing microbial species, but we haven't talked about these kinds of markers that we can look at particularly early on, um, and then having a plan of attack once we see that we have this issue. So uh, thank you for all the work you do. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, we're, we're happy be, to do being it. Being a yeah. food nerd is good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. folks. So the code is Ju uh, Dr. Judy, and that'll get you 25% off on any of those kits. That's a really, really worthwhile Yeah, and you can buy discount. more kits if you think you're going to want to do more. You can always you can so use that code you for can, you can You can stock more up than now. One. Yeah, stock up now. <laughs> oh, you can use it more than once. That's great. That's really good. All right. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Have a wonderful day. And I don't know when I'll see you again. I, I don't even know my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> you just show up where they tell you. <laughs> I do. I do. It's like now. Thank you, Dr. Redmond. Thank you. Okay. Bye.